Hello everyone and welcome to the final lecture in industrial chemistry. So today we're going to be trying to apply a lot of our knowledge to a real industrial chemical process, specifically plastic synthesis. So we're going to be able to finally bring in a little bit of chemistry to go on along with all of our process balancing. So one of the most common plastics present is uh, going to be polyethylene. And polyethylene uh, polymers tend to account for almost a third of the world plastic production. So this is one of the most common types of plastics. So it's typically uh, formed in one of two different varieties, either LDPE, so this is low density polyethylene, so this is uh, a very soft plastic, so you're going to most commonly encounter this in plastic food bags, squeezable bottles, so essentially something that's got a lot of bend to it. The emphasis here is often on soft on the plastic side. And this is going to be characterized with a recycling number of four. In contrast, high density poly polyethylene is one of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the more stiffer plastics. And so if you're gonna have, say, a much harder plastic bottle, think of milk jug, or the uh, reusable plastic grocery bags, this is also gonna be characterized with a recycling number of two. So if you encounter these numbers two or four, both of these account for polyethylene. And the biggest thing that's gonna end up changing on which one you make is gonna be reaction conditions. And not too surprisingly, as soon as you change the reaction conditions, you change the structure of the entire plant. So let's go ahead and look at the basic principle of trying to make uh, polyethylene polymers. So one of the simplest forms of polyethylene polymerization or of ethene polymerization is you take a simple ethylene species and you introduce a radical initiator uh, species. And from there, what you end up uh, seeing is a radical reaction generate. Uh, breaking the double bond, generate a radical species, which can then undergo a classic uh, chain polymerization uh, reaction. So this is going to eventually produce long chain molecules. However, one of the problems with doing these long chain molecules <laughs> along a carbon chain is there is a tendency to have what's called back chain uh, uh, transfer. So our essentially our radical species decides to, instead of breaking up a double bond, steal a hydrogen atom. And when it does this, it's gonna transfer the radical character from the end of our chain to the middle of the chain, which is then going to undergo its own chain propagation. And so what this ends up doing is it causes branched polymer formation. And so the real big difference in between low density and high density polyethylene is gonna be the extent of this branching. So low density tends to have very high branch structure. So because it's so highly branched, it means that it's much harder to essentially pack in the polymer uh, close together. And so as a result, it tends to have fairly low, what's called glass transition points of below negative 122. So this is essentially the point at which it goes from being a traditional solid to a solid with some give. And this is one of the reasons why low density polyethylene has so much give and makes a good, you know, soft disposable uh, bottle. Similarly though, it also is gonna have a very low melting point, often around about 100 degrees C, depending on uh, the ex exact structure and uh, impurities. Now, this is also one of the reasons why people tell you not to put boiling water in a plastic bottle is because even if it doesn't quite melt, you might get lucky, it's still often going to have a tendency to slowly denature the plastic. And so this is one of the things you have to watch out for. So as a result, low density polyethylene is often going to be essentially best used in this negative 50 to 50 range, which tends to be where most life occurs. So most freezers won't get below negative 50 and you pretty much have to uh, have uncomfortable heat to bust 60. So this is actually a fairly good operating range. Now our real question is how can I manufacture this material? So 
the synthesis of low density polyethylene is actually pretty straightforward. So what I'm going to need is I'm going to need some high pressure or in other words, high concentration ethylene. And I'm also going to need a peroxide initiator. So what we're often going to do is in order to get these two species um, in contact, we're going to pressurize our ethylene into a more liquid character. So again, high pressure. And in order to make my peroxide essentially soluble in the ethylene, we're going to often uh, put my peroxide in an oil carrier. And we're then going to launch it into a high temperature autoclave, which is going to act as my reactor. And so each of these autoclaves are going to be operating at very high pressure, essentially to, uh, to maximize the initiation reaction. So typically they'll be operating at about two kilobar. But one of the things you should watch out for is the efficiency of this reactor is very low. It has an individual reactor efficiency about 20%, which is going to put some constraints on our system. We also have some very strict temperature constraints. So my uh, ethylene essentially is going to go under catastrophic decomposition uh, at any temps above 310. So I can't get higher than 310. But if I get below about 110, then I have to worry about my polyethylene essentially solidifying out. And I'm going to want to keep it in the liquid phase. So we're going to be aiming for this temperature. Uh, this temperature range of about 110 to 210 or 310 and about 2000 bars. So this is actually going to put some pretty serious constraints on the react on our reactor, especially when you pair it with the fact that this reaction is exothermic in nature. So it's going to be heat releasing. So the big constraints we're going to have uh, end up having to deal with is first of all, at a 20% conversion uh, rating, I'm going to be having to use way too much reactant if I try and do a straight through reaction. So as we've seen before, you're going to need a recycling stream. I'm going to need to be able to separate my unreacted polyethylene and circle it right back in to keep my net efficiencies high enough. Similarly, if it's an exothermic reaction and it can undergo decomposition, I'm going to need a cooling jacket to counter out the exothermicity. Then one of the other big things is 2,000 bars really high. So a single compressor alone isn't actually going to be sufficient. We're going to have to use several compressors to get our poly or to bring our ethylene up from essentially the room pressure that it may be produced at by off times the neighboring oil plant in order to essentially get it up to this two kilobar. And finally, we're going to be able, we're going to need to have good mixing of our reactants and products. So we're probably going to, uh, uh, with our, of our reactants with our initiator. So we're probably going to need some form of, form of stirring. And in addition, we're also going to need to process and purify our products. So in this case, our reactor itself has been essentially established. Now I'm going to have to build a plant around that reactor to make it work. So let's go ahead and see how we can do that. So one of the uh, one example reactor that we have schematics for is the Borealis uh, polyethylene uh, reactor. So in this particular reactor, we're essentially bringing in fresh ethylene at again moderate uh, at essentially one or low pressure, so maybe up to about 15 bar. We're then going to essentially compress it up to about 40 bar. And then we're going to essentially run it through another. Uh, we're then going to essentially combine it with a recycling stream, uh, run it through a uh, run it through a filter to remove any uh, potentially damaging species such as water or other impurities. And then we're going to essentially run it through our main compressor, which is going to bring us up to about 250 bar. Again, we're now going to have to cool down the system. Then we're going to essentially run it, uh, go through another series of uh, temperature transfers, rack up our pressure for, uh, again as we combine it with our uh, with another um, recycle stream, rack up our pressure from about um, uh, from first about 250 to 1,000 bar, and then from about 1,000 to 2,000 bar in a 
essentially a third set of compressors. So watch watch out because we've gone through one, two, three, four main compressors so far. And at this point, uh, we're now going to combine the system with our initiator and then run it through usually a stirred reactor. So the reactor itself is almost the least impressive part of the system. So now that we have essentially our uh, highly pressurized product stream, we're then going to have to uh, cool it uh, cool it down a little bit and then put it through a high pressure separator. So here we're going to essentially try and pull off as much of my high pressure um, uh, polyethylene as possible, send it, uh, bring it back to temperature, uh, run it through a quick separation for any solids that may have formed, and then essentially put it back into my uh, processing stream and run it back through the uh, compressors. Then we're going to take our lower pressure product stream, run it through a low pressure separator, which in and of itself is then going to undergo a series of uh, purifications and heat transfers, and then again be put into the recycling stream. However, if we have a certain, uh, if it's gained enough impurity, we may end up sending it to a storage tank or back to a cracker, in, depending on uh, the constraints in any given day. So at this point, we've essentially been able to remove most of our polyethylene, and we can send most of the rest through an extruder where we're generating essentially uh, plastic pellets, which can then be processed elsewhere. However, it's also possible that instead of using a semi-batch or CSTR uh, reactor, we can instead switch to a tubular reactor. So this is again going to be a plug flow reactor, or essentially a flow through reactor. So these tend to also work at fairly high pressures, in fact, often a little bit higher. And as a consequence, they tend to have slightly higher conversion rates. So it's gonna have several key advantages, and most of these go with the classic uh, uh, flow reactor style. First, the higher external surface area is gonna give us much better temperature control. I'm gonna be much less in need of a cooling jacket as air alone may be sufficient at this point. And as we saw with the advantages of flow reactors or using multiple CSDRs, we can also decrease the residence time by increasing the relative catalytic efficiency of the system. So again, it's going to give us a slightly different uh, uh, process diagram as demonstrated by this Exxon Mobil polyethylene uh, plant, which is again, hooked up right up to one of Mexon Mobile's uh, uh, gas refineries where they bring in the raw uh, ethylene, they go ahead and run the system through a filter, then again, through again, a primary and a secondary compressors where they're adding in any, uh, any of their uh, initiators or any co-monomers, so essentially any additives they wanna put into the plastic. <clears throat> then the final peroxide initiator, will essentially be added in at several smaller intervals into the actual uh, tool or reactor. So essentially there's going to be several ports inside the reactor. Then we'll essentially send the whole reaction through a control valve and then again through the high pressure separator where again we separate any uh, wax and unreacted product and then add it straight into the recycle stream. And again, you'll do the same thing with a low density, uh, with a low pressure separator. And so from here, you'll notice that the pressure uh, systems and the separators look fairly similar, but some of the details with, um, uh, with the uh, system cooling and the purification can change slightly in nature. However, one of the other things that's worth noting is that you can use the reactor conditions to help modify uh, the exact nature of the low density polyethylene that you're generating. So essentially what you can do is by changing the temperature, pressure, and peroxide, you can change uh, essentially, the big thing we're looking at is chain length, as well as degree of, uh, of degree of branching. So our dominant control is going to tend to be temperature. So the higher the temperature of the system, the more I'm going to move this diagram to the left, uh, 
with lower, uh, the more I'm gonna move it to lower weights and higher branching. And again, less, uh, less initiator is going to give me uh, higher, uh, higher weights and less branching. So again, you can give fine control. Uh, however, we can also take a net look at the general uh, production of low density polyethylene and its, <coughs> uh, and its general production. So it's worth noting that a lot of this plastic is going to be further refined on site and maybe even sold in bricks, depending on who the major purchases are. But let's go ahead and head and take a look at the major numbers as of 2000 about kind of the efficiency of the process. So in order to make one ton or 2,000 pounds of low density polyethylene, it's gonna take essentially an extra 240 pounds of monomer that more or less gets wasted, as well as over a thousand kilowatt hours. So again, we're talking of uh, fairly decent efficiencies in terms of uh, monomer, but a fair, a fair bit of energy consumption with, again, most of this is being spent on those pesky compressors and on the cooling that is a consequence. Because as I compress the system, it will heat up, as well as I'm dealing with the net exothermicity of dealing with a, a radical initiated reaction. However, it is also worth noting that we are going to be generating a certain amount of uh, volatile organic carbons, which are going to be essentially toxic uh, gaseous hazardous waste, as well as especially dealing with the initiator, we're also going to be generating a small amount of normal hazardous waste. However, it is worth noting these are fairly low levels, as I've generated uh, 2,000 pounds of product, but net less than 20 pounds of hazardous waste, either as uh, gaseous or solid composition. So this is actually a pretty good descript description of low density polyethylene. However, we also have high density polyethylene. So the higher density here comes from the fact that high density polyethylene tends to be much more of a st one single straight long chain with very minimal branching. So any branches that occur are often few and far in between and fairly small in nature. And because of this longer straighter chain, it's gonna have much better IMFs before between the long chains present. And as such, it's gonna have slightly higher uh, glass points, though you'll notice still is going to be uh, very plastic and a little less brittle in nature under any uh, temperature regimes we're gonna be looking at. But it's also gonna have slightly higher melting points. So notice that this isn't still, uh, this isn't too far above uh, the boiling point of water, but still try and avoid putting Boil, too much boiling water in any of these plastic species as it may undergo some uh, decomposition. But because of this essentially harder structure, uh, this tighter structure, it's going to be much harder in nature. And again, we have a much wider application range, which is going to be uh, uh, very useful when dealing with, again, not quite boiling water, but again, much more high temp conditions. However, we're also going to have to change the nature of this reaction. So I can't use an uncontrolled radical initiator as it's going to be far too random in nature. So one of the biggest differences in between high density polyethylene and low density is the use of a catalyst. So we're generally going to control polyethylene group grow through the use of a catalyst, which is going to prevent any use of branches because this is going to tightly bind the radical character into one place and is going to give us a much higher preference to only attacking alkenes and not uh, unintentionally undergoing uh, hydrogen transfer of a straight chain. Now there's two different catalysts that are most commonly used. Uh, the first one we're going to address is called the Ziegler Nata. So this is essentially an aluminum titanium uh, based catalyst, which is often going to be uh, mounted on a magnesium chloride solid. And this is going to be characteristic of most of these catalysts, is that it's an active catalytic compound presented on a much more inert metal species. So again, we're dealing with solid catalysts, which is very much going to control the nature of the reaction. 
So in this case, what we tend to find is that the titanium is going to be the major agent in control of, uh, of the growth of the catalyst, whereas the major uh, purpose of the alumina is to give us a good way to release the species. So essentially, if I expose the Ziegler nata catalyst to water, it's then going to cleave and release my polyethylene. So by controlling the amount of water present in the catalyst, I can essentially control the chain length and the rate of release. We have a fairly similar process with the Phillips catalyst, which is a chromium-based uh, silica catalyst. You may notice that the chromium species that we're dealing with here is hexavalent chromium, that most famous of toxic species from Aaron Brockovich, as it is a fairly good catalyst species, as well as being used in stainless steel. So this is going to be essentially immobilized on a clay-like or silica surface, and the mechanism is going to be fairly similar to Ziegler nata. Uh, the biggest difference is going to be the chain termination. So instead of releasing uh, polyethylene upon exposure to water, it's now going to be released on exposure to molecular hydrogen. However, realize that most of these plants are already nearby uh, oil refineries, and you'll note that they will have a decent source of hydrogen gas as well as polyethylene present. So because we have a catalyst, this is going to drastically change our reaction conditions. Most specifically, we're going to be using much lower temperatures and pressures, as I no longer have to rely on uh, overcoming a higher activation barrier and the nearby presence of another ethylene molecule, which is going to give us a much more uh, uh, benevolent reaction condition. Specifically, we're typically going to be running the reaction at temperatures below about 100 degrees, 120 degrees C. So at this point, it is worth noting polyethylene is going to be solid. But I can't get it too low, because if I get it below 80, 80 degrees C, it's going to become a little too solid and a little bit uh, too recalcitrant. However, as you may notice, working with a polyethylene solid can be a little bit messy. So we're going to essentially add in a little bit of hexane to, call what, uh, to make what's essentially called slurry. So a good way to think about this is I've essentially suspended my plastic in hexane. So to a certain extent, we're dissolving the polyethylene, thus one of the needs for these higher temperatures. Uh, and the pressure is mostly going to be essentially to keep hexane from evaporating a little bit too quickly. So a good way to think about what's ending up happening is I've got the, uh, I'm going to have small granules of solid catalyst that essentially are going to grow plastic all around them. Then what I'm going to need to do is if I add a little bit of water, it's going to terminate the process. So we're going to then inactivate or kill the catalyst. So this is worth noting. <laughs> that this catalyst is going to be rendered uh, semi-unusable. Then what we are going to do is, uh, then we can essentially, by controlling the amount of water, I can help control chain length, and we can then also control branching by uh, other properties such as the temperature of the system, and again, also the amount of hexane present. But you may notice that we have much different constraints on a reactor design than the low density system. And you can see this in the actual reactor. So I'm going to essentially start by combining a certain ratio of ethylene and hydrogen catalyst. You can also put in a certain amount of co-monomer. <coughs> Sorry, the ethylene and the hydrogen inactivator. I'm going to put them in a series of CSDRs where I'm essentially going to be slowly upgrading the system. And again, reaction will still be exothermic, so I'm going to need cold, uh, a cold water as a coolant. Then I'm going to essentially be pulling off my slurry, run it through a, uh, through a decanter, <coughs> where I'm then going to uh, try and pull off uh, some of the hexane, and then I'm going to, uh, hexane, and then I'm going to run the whole thing through a centrifuge where again, I'm going to pull off as much of the liquid hexane as possible and then run it through a recycle and feed it back into the reactor. And again, feed in any of my solid catalysts, whether it's Ziegler nata 
uh, as in this case with a height uh, Ziegler nata, or as in this case, a, uh, a Phillips catalyst, as indicated by the presence of a hydrogen uh, react a hydrogen inactivator. Then I can then simply pull off uh, uh, pull off the residue of my plastic slurry, dry off any remaining hexane. Uh, and solidify it under nitrogen purification, uh, powderize it, and then uh, heat it back up for uh, to form uh, reactive pellets. So not too surprisingly, we can also adjust this process for a flow through reactor. So these are essentially going to be plug flow reactors, because notice we do have uh, catalysts, and they're going to be running through loops, as is seen here on the right, which is actually a I believe a Texas uh, uh, high density polyethylene plug flow reactor. So this is going to help, just as we saw before, give us greater temperature, pressure, and flow control. And what's worth noting is that with this extra control, uh, we can also help increase, increase the efficiencies uh, to over 95%. So thus, we no longer need any form of ethylene recovery. And again, this is largely driven by I don't need to overpressurize the system. Uh, in addition, uh, the catalyst is going to help me uh, help me attack almost any ethylene present. Uh, also, because we've got solid polyethylene, all I need to do in order to uh, remove the product is just essentially pull out any solid and uh, remove that. So we can essentially continuously remove any solid at the end of each. Uh, at the end of each loop. Uh, however, not too surprisingly, you can also, uh, uh, with the use of the um, small catalyst particles, turn high-density polyethylene manufacture into a fluidized bed reactor. So not too surprisingly, we're still going to maintain fairly low uh, temperatures, but we're going to increase our pressures pressures up to 30 to 35 in order to maintain that fluidized bed, essentially to keep the particles uh, moving. So in this case, we're going to be pumping in straight ethylene gas. We no longer have to include the hexane, and we're going to use it to suspend a bed of solid gas particles. So again, this process is fairly nice as I no longer have to use uh, the hexane. And then we'll essentially pull out the catalyst polymer mixtures essentially continuously. Uh, and again, we're going to co-feed in either the hydrogen or the water to control or terminate chain length. And again, you'll may notice here I'm pulling in my uh, ethylene purified to remove any sort of impurities that may come in through the oil plant. Uh, pressurize it up to run through the plug flow reactor. <laughs> combined with any form of unreacted uh, recovery or of unreacted polyethylene, run the system through, <laughs> uh, through a series of uh, separators, at which point I'm just letting the system degas, then take that uh, degassed uh, ethylene and recompress. And then at this point, uh, simply uh, pelletalize and add any additives in the drying system. So you may notice that this form of gas phase fluidized uh, bed reactor is indeed much more simpler than any rea other reactor we've seen so far. Now again, trying to average out all of these various different schemes, one of the things that we may note is we have a fairly similar efficiency in the monomer consumption, which is actually fairly impressive when you account for the fact that there's a little bit less recycling of monomer done in the high density polyethylene manufacture. We're also using about uh, we're also using about three thousand or three hundred less kilowatt hours per ton manufactured, as well as slightly reduced water uh, consumption, though fairly similar levels of uh, organic mat uh, organic carbon and hazardous waste. However, uh, again. These numbers will very much change depending on the exact nature of the high density polyethylene. And um, as a consequence, the temperature and 
uh, branching characteristics. However, if we want something that makes use of a catalyst, but has a certain, um, uh, but is a little bit softer, one of the tricks we can do is emulate low density polyethylene by copolymerizing high density polyethylene with long chain, uh, uh, long chain molecules such as N-hexene. At this point, what we're gonna do is regularly include uniform, essentially, uh, one, two, three, four, four carbon uh, long branches at irregular intervals, which again is going to give me some of the same softness that we saw before, but you'll notice it maintains a lot of the high thermal capacities that we see in high density polyethylene. And again, the process can actually be done mostly by taking a pre-existing uh, uh, scheme as we see for a high density polyethylene plant and just simply add in a copolymer. And in this case, all we need to do is take in the previous diagram we saw for the Lindell uh, basal plant and essentially just add in the co-monomer. And again, this reactor was again run through uh, uh, CSTRs in series. And again, just as we saw previously, further refinement can happen on site. And again, as we saw previously, fairly high efficiencies, about a 10% wastage of monomer. And again, uh, slightly improved thermal efficiencies over the high density polyethylene. One of the biggest reasons uh, of this is that most of the low density, uh, linear low density polyethylene has been constructed in relatively newer factories. And as a result, uh, tends to see across the bar, uh, board, lower water consumption and, uh, and toxic emissions. And so one of the things that I really want you to take away from the manufacture of these plastics is how a lot of uh, industrial chemistry plants are constructed. You build up your whole process around, uh, around your reactor and what its demands are, and then you're essentially trying to support the whole system to maintain the pressures, temperatures, purifications, and recycle streams that are required just to maintain that one reactor. So while we as chemists tend to focus a lot on the chemical reactions, it's worth noting that we have to acknowledge the support system that has to go in all around it. And being aware of that wider support system can help you make, a, make you a better chemist. And I hope, you, uh, hope that you've been able to take a wide uh, take in an appreciation of the wider environment of chemical industry after having taken this course. Thank you for, uh, for your time and take care.